Albert Nash was born in Whitley, uh, near, Gil near Guildford, on the 16th of February, 1899. Uh, he was the middle of five children uh, born to George and Letitia Nash. Um, George and Letitia, or George had been uh, born in Whitley, um, like his son, uh, but he'd moved away to Shamley Green, which is a few miles away from there to work, and there he met uh, a local girl, Letitia Billinghurst, and they married. They came back to George's home village uh, and settled down to have a family there. Uh, sadly, George died in his, uh, in his mid-30s, um, shortly before the birth of their, their final child. Uh, it was a tragedy for the family, and it meant that they had to split up. Um, Letitia took her girls, and she moved in with George's brother. Uh, they eventually married and went on to have children of their own. Um, but the boys um, were split up between other branches of the family, and so it was that Albert came from Wickley to Banstead. Um, he came to stay um, with his aunt, Olive. Now, she had married um, a Banstead chap, Thomas Wallace, he was the son of a wheelwright that used to have a shop um, where the entrance to Waitrose car park um, is now. Thomas, um, we've commemorated his brother, William, who was the first of our, um, our casualties in the Third Battle of Ypres, Passchendaele, uh, died on the very first day fighting uh, with a guards regiment. Um, Thomas and Olive lived in Lyme Regis Road. Um, they lived in a new semi-detached villa. Uh, it's now number 13, but at the time it was number two Lulworth Cottages. Lulworth Cottages were or are um, a, a pair of semi-detached villas and a row of maisonettes. The maisonettes were the very first purpose-built maisonettes um, in Banstead uh, and they were home to young families much like today you know young families were struggling to get onto the housing ladder and you would have to live with your parents for an awful long time even after you were married and so these maisonettes were an ideal solution for, for young families in particular and also it's the first place that we start to see single women um, being able to afford to live on their own as well. So it is that Lulworth Cottages with these population of young men um, suffer some very high casualties and uh, you know over half of Lyme Regis Road's casualties come from just those very few uh, those very few houses. So Thomas and Olive lived at num number two which is now number um, 13 and Albert moved in with them. It was a, an entirely new area of the village it had been built over the last 25 years about 250 new houses halfway between Banstead and Burr Heath um, cut off from the main village at Banstead by the Garrett's Hall estate which wouldn't be developed until the 1930s um, and although it didn't ever really get a name of its own, it was sort of they were referred to as the villa dwellers by the people um, of Banstead, um, they had their own shops, they had their own pub, they were really a little village in their own right, and they were half Banstead and half Burr Heath. And so we see that the children end up going to school both at Banstead and at Burr Heath. And Albert ended up going to the Burr Heath Church of England School, which is now uh, Chips Folly. Um, the building which stands opposite St Mary's, which would, would have been just being built at the time um, that Albert came to, uh, came to Banstead. There were about 100 children or so at the Church of England School. It's slightly, it was slightly bigger uh, than the remaining uh, building. Headmaster was a bit of a disciplinarian, uh, and Albert racked up something like 27 strokes of a cane during his time there for all sorts of things like throwing bits of rubber around and touching the piano without permission and all these sorts of things. And he was useless at blotting as well, so he was caned three times for poor blotting of his work. Um, but he did really well actually. He managed to make it to standard seven, which is the highest um, standard you could reach um, in school at that time. Now you would spend your early school years learning a lot of reading, writing, arithmetic and scripture by rote, um, but as you got to this, this later stage, um, you'd be expected to learn these things for yourself from a book and you'd start doing more history, more geography, even some basic scientific experiments, these sorts of things. And you'd also probably spend a lot of your time helping to teach the younger children um, as well, uh, particularly gifted pupils who might one day make teachers were sent off to pupil teacher training centres in places like Sutton. Uh, and then they'd come back uh, and they'd come back and they'd help out the masters and they'd sometimes be left to supervise quite large classes um, on their own. Albert probably wasn't one of these uh, one of these boys, but he may well have helped out with some of those, some of those teaching, um, teaching some of those youngsters. Uh, he may have kept birds. Uh, there was an A. Nash, there was also an Arthur Nash in the village. Well, there was an A. Nash who won third prize in the children's category for caged birds at the inaugural Banstead and Burheath District <coughs> Fur and Feather Association uh, show, which was held on the site of what's now, uh, what's now Asda. Uh, and some of, quite a few of our men actually appeared there keeping rabbits and birds and dogs and all these sorts of things. Um, he left school at the standard age of 14, uh, and he probably joined the post office. Um, his uncle was a postman. Um, now, the post office was civil service, um, so it promised you a lifelong career and a good pension, provided that you made 
the grade. And a very attractive option, we see quite a lot of our boys becoming messenger boys. And this is probably what um, Albert did. He became a telegraph messenger boy. We had a sub-post office at Banstead, one at Burr Heath as well. Uh, telegrams would come in and they would have to then deliver them around the countryside on their bicycle. They would have worn um, a smart uniform. It was based on the Royal Artillery's uniforms at the time. Um, they would have had to be drilled, so they would have unserviceable rifles and they'd parade twice a week. Uh, and they practice the, you know, improve their discipline upon, upon military lines. They'd be expected to be educated for several hours each week. So he probably had some sort of a private tutor um, during that period as well. Um, you weren't just going to be given one of these careers on a plate. You had to, you had to earn it. You had to show your worth. And so you do this for two years until you were 16. And at that point, they decide whether they'd let you go or they'd keep you on. And if you were kept on, you would become a postman or you could become a telegraphist. Uh, and it seems that this is what happened to Albert because he was uh, a telegraphist when he joined um, the armed services um, a couple of years later. So he would have been a very skilled worker at that time. He would have been much in demand. And so when he was old enough to join the services, he wouldn't be sent to the trenches. He had a very specific job to do. He was conscripted when he turned 18. The only choice you had in, when conscription came in was whether he wanted to join the Navy or not. He chose, it seems, to join the Navy. Um, he was trained up as, as a telegraphist. He spent um, several months um, having his basic training that all, everyone that, that joined the Navy um, did. And then after that, uh, that was at Crystal Palace, which had been turned into a vast um, training camp for the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. Uh, and after that, he got his first um, training posting, which was to Grimsby. Um, supporting the, uh, the trawler fleet um, that was sweeping for mines there. And so he would have been um, on a shore base, HMS Pekin, uh, and he would have been learning how to, to be a, a naval telegraphist under the supervision of, of more experienced men. And after two months of this, he came uh, to complete his training at Chatham um, in Kent. There was a, a big naval base there, HMS Pembroke, um, and they had a telegraphy school, which had been established uh, many years beforehand and he would have completed his training there. It was the scene of one of the worst um, home front tragedies of the war. They had this enormous drill hall um, there, which had been converted into accommodation for the cadets that were training there. Uh, it, had a, a, it, was, it was perfect for training because it had a, an enormous glass roof, which let in a lot of daylight and everyone could see what they were doing. Uh, unfortunately, um, the Germans bombed it one night uh, when the cadets were sleeping below and there were something like 150 deaths as a result of that, most of them from glass splinters of the roof. He'd uh, finished his training there at the end of 1917, and he got uh, his first and only operational posting. He was sent down to Portsmouth, uh, and he joined um, the crew of a patrol boat, a P-class boat, P-40. Um, HMS P-40 is not perhaps the most inspiring uh, name, uh, but there were quite a lot of these and they seem to have run out of inspiration uh, for, for naming them all. These were small, these were a okay, crew of 50. Uh, like the trawlers, they had a very shallow draft, they sat very high, um, you know, very high up so they could go right into the edge of the coastline, right in almost to the beach. They had a very, very low profile with a very low superstructure so they'd be very hard to spot. They kind of looked like a submarine would do, as a, a, a surfaced submarine uh, going along um, going on the surface of the waves. Um, they were very lightly armed. Their guns were probably not much use for, for, for anything at all. Um, but they had uh, torpedo tubes um, fitted initially on the sort of facing towards the back. And these were later replaced with depth charges. Uh, and it was probably, a P-40 was probably fitted with depth charges at the time that Albert joined them. But their main weapon was their prow. It was made, the boat was made from mild steel, but the prow was made from hardened steel. It was a ram. Uh, and their job was to spot submarines and then ram them. They could do a top speed of about 21 knots, which meant they were a lot slower than destroyers, which could manage about 30 knots, which were some of the fastest ships in the sea. But they were fast enough to overhaul um, a submarine. Uh, and so it was, they'd escort um, vessels in and out of Portsmouth Harbour, maybe shepherd them along, along the coastline, perhaps across the English Channel. They were too small uh, and vulnerable to, to go on the high seas. They couldn't go out onto the ocean. Uh, but they could do this patrol work and um, clo uh, escort close into the coast um, very well. Uh, they would go out on these anti-submarine patrols as well, um, looking, looking for them. Uh, they would, because of their low profile, this would be difficult for the submarines to spot them. Uh, they might even mistake them for a fellow U-boat, perhaps. Um, they would be fast enough to, to catch up with these submarines and ram them uh, and sink them, or if the submarine had dived in time, they could use their depth charges. 
um, to, to stop them. They, was, they had a reputation for being very good at their job. I haven't found a confirmed record of, of them actually sinking a U-boat, but they are said to have been, uh, said to have been good at that work. Sadly, um, I don't think any of their logbooks have survived, so we don't really know exactly what they were up to um, day to day, but I hope that gives you uh, some sort of an idea. Um, small ships and big ships, all kinds of ships, they were all vulnerable when Spanish flu um, came along. It would have been brought into Portsmouth at some point in the autumn. Very soon, almost every ship that was calling at Portsmouth would have taken away Spanish flu with it. So it was that the crew of the P-40 uh, would have become ill. Um, Albert uh, fell ill uh, in early November, just a few days ago, 100, day, 100 years um, ago. Um, it was a deadly infection. It, it struck the young particularly hard. And the theory is that the young have very healthy immune systems and it's the body's own immune system trying to cure itself that overreacts and kills the, kills the patient as a, as a side effect. Pneumonia develops as a complication uh, and that's what kills them. Uh, lungs fill with fluid, they can't breathe, they turn blue, uh, and within a matter of hours or days, um, they die. There's nothing that you can do by, by that point except to make them comfortable and hope for the best. Uh, Albert was 19 years old. He's buried in Haslar Royal Naval Cemetery. Uh, he's commemorated here in the church on the village war memorial, on the churchyard war memorial, uh, and also in St Mary's um, Burr Heath as well. I'm going to use the prayer that we were given on Saturday, after Saturday's service, and I think there are still copies there on the table if you want to take one away. It's together with the um, reflection that we had for four voices. Um, nice memorial to have, I think. <clears throat> so let us pray. Father of all, remember your promise and look with love on your people, living and departed. On this day, we especially ask that you would hold forever all who suffered during the First World War. Especially today, we remember Albert Ashe. Those who returned scarred by warfare, those who waited anxiously at home, and those who returned wounded and disillusioned, those who mourned, and those communities that were diminished and suffered loss. Remember too those who acted with kindly compassion, those who bravely risked their own lives for their comrades, and those who, in the aftermath of war, worked tirelessly for a more peaceful world. And as you remember them, remember us, O Lord. Grant us peace in our time and a longing for the day when people of every language, race and nation will be brought into the unity of Christ's kingdom. This we ask in the name of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And shall we join together in saying the, Lord that Je the prayer that Jesus taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the queen, the commonwealth and all people, unity, peace and concord, and to us and all God's servants, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all and remain with us always. Amen.